the Kurdistan region of Iraq, also known simply just as Iraqi Kurdistan, is not an independent country, although it is like one in many ways. It has its own unique and separate political system with its own political parties and institutions, and on paper, this political system looks pretty standard. It's a multi-party democracy with a single chamber parliament, a prime minister, and a president. But look under the hood at how the politics of the Kurdistan region actually works, and this is a political system like no other. I promise you, this is going to be interesting. Hi everyone, I'm Fredo Rockwell, and welcome to my video where I at least try to explain how the politics of Iraqi Kurdistan actually works. So let's start things off with the word Kurdistan itself, which, depending on which country you live in, can be a very controversial term. Kurdistan has several meanings. In its broadest sense, it refers to the territory which stretches across the Middle East, in Syria, Turkey, Iraq, and Iran, where an estimated 30 to 40 million Kurdish people make up the majority of the population. The idea of Kurdistan in any form has historically been seen as a threat by these four countries, and in some of these countries, there have been multiple attempts to try and eliminate Kurdish culture, Kurdish languages, and sometimes even the Kurdish people themselves. There has never been an independent country of Kurdistan in modern history. Not really. But in the last two decades, there are two, let's call them proto-states, where Kurdish people have formed autonomous communities. One, called the Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria, which is much more commonly known simply as Rojava, emerged in 2012 during the height of the Syrian civil war. This territory is de facto independent, and that's a subject I'd like to make another video about soon. But two decades before the formation of Rojava, in the wake of the 1991 Persian Gulf War, Iraq's Kurdish people formed their own autonomous proto-state in the far north of that country. Initially, like Rojava, this wasn't done with anyone's permission. The US-led coalition had enforced a no-fly zone over the northern section of Iraq. This prevented the Iraqi government, then led by dictator Saddam Hussein, from enforcing any military superiority over the region. And this allowed Iraq's Kurdish people to finally gain their own political autonomy after decades of extreme oppression. How extreme? Really extreme. The most infamous example was a chemical weapons attack on the Kurdish people of Halabja in 1988, during the final phases of Iraq's long and pointless war with Iran. Between 3,200 and 5,000 people, mostly civilians, were killed by shells which contained poison gas and an estimated 7,000 to 10,000 more people were injured. These are shocking numbers, but it is the way that these people were attacked which is especially horrific. Chemical weapons are a type of weapon of mass destruction. Since World War I, they have been outlawed by multiple international treaties, and using them anywhere for any reason is generally considered to be a war crime. And the Halabja massacre was just one small part of a much wider campaign against Iraq's Kurdish civilians in the 1980s, known as the Anfal Genocide, in which Saddam Hussein's regime killed up to 182,000 people. To try and prevent another genocide from happening in the wake of the 1991 Persian Gulf War, the US military and its coalition partners launched Operation Provide Comfort, which effectively kept the Iraqi military out of the northernmost part of the country, and allowed the region to begin governing itself. On May 19, 1992, the people of Kurdistan held their first parliamentary election, which took place across 178 polling stations. Launching a democratically elected Kurdish parliament so quickly was a major accomplishment. The two main rival parties during that election were the Kurdish Democratic Party, or KDP, and the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, or PUK. The election results were very tight, but considering the situation, the two parties did something which was undoubtedly in the national interest. They formed a government of national unity. Now, before we go any farther, we need to discuss these two parties, as they continue to have an outsized influence on Kurdish politics today. The KDP was founded in 1946 and its first leader was a Kurdish freedom fighter named Mustafa Barzani. Now remember that name. The Barzani family still runs the KDP, and much of Iraqi Kurdistan for that matter. Mustafa's grandson, 
Nitrovan Barzani, is currently the president of the Kurdistan region, and another grandson, Masrur Barzani, is the prime minister. In 1975, following an internal disagreement, a group of KDP members, led by Jalal Talabani, broke away and formed the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, the PUK. Like the Barzani family, the Talabani family remains extremely influential. Jalal Talabani served as president of Iraq, as in all of Iraq, between 2005 and 2014, and the current leader of the PUK today is Jalal's son, Bafal Talabani. As both the KDP and the PUK are parties of national liberation, like South Africa's African National Congress or Western Sahara's Polisario, both parties were founded with military wings. These are the famous Peshmerga, which literally means those who face death. And I say famous because anyone who has paid much attention to any of the conflicts in Iraq in the past 30 years will have heard of the Peshmerga. Almost certainly, they will have heard good things. They're a fighting force with a reputation for bravery and effectiveness. Honestly, if you're into anything military, you probably think that the Peshmerga are cool. But what I had not realized until I started making this video is that there is not one Peshmerga which is defending the interests of Iraq's Kurdish people. There are two, a KDP-controlled Peshmerga and a PUK-controlled Peshmerga. And what really surprised me was to learn that even today, 30 years after the founding of Iraqi Kurdistan, there are still two different Peshmergas. There have been many attempts over the years to combine these two forces. And in 2014, there were even several attempts to create combined military units. But nevertheless, they remain distinctly different fighting forces with different command structures. And whoever is officially in power, each group takes its orders from its own party's leadership. Another feature which arises from the KDP and PUK both having their own military force is that at the end of the Persian Gulf War, both parties controlled distinctly different territory. The KDP captured what became the north of Iraqi Kurdistan, while the PUK controlled the south. Unsurprisingly, when the 1992 parliamentary election was held, these are the areas where these parties got the majority of their votes. And even today, the KDP gets most of its votes from the north of Iraqi Kurdistan, while the PUK overwhelmingly gets its votes from the South. So let's recap the situation as it was in the early 1990s. Iraqi Kurdistan is surrounded on all sides by hostile regimes, is being caught up in the UN sanctions against Iraq, which were not directed at Kurdistan, but were still playing havoc with their local economy. The newly formed government is run by two rival political parties, each with a famously tenacious military, and each of which totally dominates the politics in one half of the country it wasn't really a recipe for a very stable situation. Skirmishes between the KDP and the PUK inevitably broke out, and eventually it tipped over into a full-scale civil war. Peshmerga versus Peshmerga. The situation escalated in 1997, when Turkey invaded Iraqi Kurdistan to attack bases belonging to the Kurdish Workers' Party, more commonly known as the PKK. The PKK is the party of national liberation for Turkey's Kurdish people which has long been considered to be a terrorist organization by the Turkish government. The PKK from Turkey aligned with the PUK in Iraq, so the Turkish military aligned with the KDP, and by the time it was all said and done, an estimated 5,000 to 8,000 people were dead. But the U.S. government in Washington brokered a ceasefire in 1998, and for the next five years or so, the PUK region of Kurdistan, known as the Green Zone, and the KDP-administered region, known as the Yellow Zone, operated as more or less separate entities. In 2003, the U.S. actively coordinated with the Peshmerga, both of them, for their invasion of Iraq, and increasingly began treating the Kurds as an ally in the region. Although it was a humanitarian disaster for most of Iraq, the U.S. invasion did coincide with some relatively good times for the Kurdistan region. In 2005, there were elections for a new Kurdistan region parliament, and the KDP and PUK put aside their differences and formed a coalition. Unsurprisingly, that coalition won a whopping 90% of the vote. Masoud Barzani, son of the former KDP leader Mustafa Barzani, was elected president of Kurdistan. And in a turnout for the books, PUK leader Jalal Talabani, as I mentioned before, was elected president of all of Iraq a few months later. 
And so having divided the spoils neatly down the middle, the combined KDP PUK juggernaut had pretty much total control of the Kurdistan regional government. That is until the next election in 2009. 2009 was the year when politics in Iraqi Kurdistan was changed by a party called, called Change. Actually, it's more commonly referred to by its Kurdish name, Garan. Founded by Naushiran Mustafa, a former KDP member and one of the co-founders of the PUK, Garan contested the 2009 Kurdish election on a platform of reform. Mustafa called the Barzani and Talabani families outmoded tribal leaders and accused them of administering Iraqi Kurdistan like it was a Soviet republic. He accused both families of treating the government like a business and of using it to enrich themselves, their relatives, and party members. And despite the 2009 elections taking place just three months after Garan was founded, Mustafa's party delivered an electoral shock and picked up nearly a quarter of the vote, mostly from voters in the Sulaymaniyya government, which had previously been PUK territory. So these are more or less the three major groups which exist in Iraqi Kurdish politics today, the KDP, the PUK, and Garan. There are also some smaller parties, including some socialist parties, a coalition of Islamist groups, and 11 seats are always reserved for ethnic minorities, Turkmen, Assyrians, and Armenians. After the entry of Goran, the KDP and the PUK decided to end their coalition for the 2013 election. Goran again received about 25% of the vote, and entered into coalition with the KDP, freezing the PUK out of government for the first time in the region's history. Goran entered into a coalition with the KDP on the basis that it needed to be part of government in order to enact reform. And Goran remained a party which badly wanted to reform Kurdistan's politics. But unlike the KDP or the PUK, Goran didn't have its own army. They wanted to drive a program of reform by talking. And that turned out to be very optimistic. As part of its coalition deal with the KDP, Goran was given several key ministries in the government, and a Goran member named Yusuf Muhammad was even elected as the parliament speaker. But despite being officially in charge, Goran's elected officials never had real control over the ministries which, in theory, they were in charge of. Civil servants would just ignore orders given by Goran ministers, and instead would go to the party leaders that they had been taking orders from for decades. In 2015, things got much worse for Goran. President Barzani had been in office since 2005. The constitution allowed a maximum term of 10 years, but with a two-year extension possible with parliamentary approval. But Goran wanted Barzani out as part of its mission of reform. And the parliamentary speaker, remember, was Goran MP Yusuf Muhammad. Yusuf Muhammad never got the chance to debate the issue of the president's term extension, however, as KDP Peshmerga fighters blocked him from entering Erbil, the Kurdistan region's capital. So the Goran Speaker of Parliament, where the KDP and Goran both together formed the government, was prevented from reaching parliament by KDP troops for two years. Without a speaker, the parliament could not meet, meaning that the KDP Peshmerga basically closed the national legislature for two years. Without a military force of its own, Goran was unable to stop the KDP. If the KDP wanted to enforce its will militarily inside the capital, there was nothing anyone could really do to stop them. To be fair, this was a really difficult time. This was at the height of the Islamic State terrorist group, when Iraq's central government had lost control of much of its territory, and the Peshmerga were actively and successfully beating back IS fighters and capturing territory. Defeating IS was an immediate and existential problem for Iraq and Iraqi Kurdistan. But if you'll remember, IS seemed to be on the verge of becoming a global threat. So it really could be argued that the whole world owes a debt of gratitude to KDP and PUK Peshmerga fighters. But that same KDP Peshmerga force which was defeating IS was also preventing a democratically elected parliament from functioning at home, which is at best a weird thing to do, and at worst, is downright oppressive. In 2017, the founder of Goran, Naushiran Mustafa, passed away. And in the 2018 election, Goran was reduced to just 12 seats. From what I've read, it is no longer considered a serious force for reform in Iraqi Kurdistan. Today, the Islamic State is defeated, Iraqi Kurdistan is at peace, and the oil business is booming. According to the Financial Times, 
Gross crude oil sales in 2020 amounted to $4.5 billion. And in general, Iraqi Kurdistan is considered to be peaceful and prosperous. You know, the nice part of Iraq. So everything in Iraqi Kurdistan is tickety-boo, right? Well, unfortunately, no. Not, not yet, anyway. From what I've read, and from what several people in Iraqi Kurdistan that I spoke to for this video have told me, things are actually really tough. And a lot of this is arguably down to politics. The Kurdistan regional government claims the country is a beacon of tolerance. But journalists who report on anti-government protests or public sector wages not being paid have ended up in prison. Trials of these journalists have been condemned by international observers. Speaking about the trial of Sherwan Sherwani, Human Rights Watch said the proceedings against him were, quote, marred by serious violations of fair trial standards. The Barzani and Talibani families dominate their respective political parties, the KDP and the PUK, as we've discussed. But their control also extends into the private sector. In the 2010 WikiLeaks dump of American diplomatic cables was a 2005 message which said the economy was, quote, tightly wrapped in the tentacles of the KDP and PUK. An estimated 1 million people, that's one in five Iraqi Kurds, receive a government salary or government pension. That's a lot. And the high number is possibly down to the KDP and PUK using government employment to buy loyalty. I've also read allegations that without party connections, it's extremely hard to get a government job. According to a 2020 audit performed by Deloitte, when the government sells oil from Iraqi Kurdistan's vast natural reserves, it only receives 29% of the revenue. The government says this is because of high operational costs, which they hope to bring down. But anti-corruption campaigners and opposition MPs are not convinced by this. When people can't work or when government wages are not paid, this leads to unrest and anti-government protests. And if you help organize any of these protests or report on them, that can land you in jail. So it's a pretty tough situation for millions of Iraqi Kurds who lack connections to the Barzani or Talibani families. And fixing this will be very difficult. As the 2021 Freedom House report on Iraq says, in the Kurdistan region, democratic institutions lack the strength to contain the influence of longstanding power brokers. So there's another issue I've not brought up yet. Is Iraqi Kurdistan seeking independence? Yes, it is. A referendum on independence was held in 2005. This was a non-binding referendum, held when the Iraqi central government was still on its knees, and it returned an overwhelming result. 98.5% of voters supported independence. But none of the countries located around the Kurdistan region wanted an independent Kurdish state on their borders, not with each of these countries playing host to millions of Kurds who might also aspire to have their own independent Kurdish state. And it's just my opinion, but I sort of doubt that the United States government wants the Kurdistan region to be independent either. Inside Iraq, it's a valuable ally. Outside Iraq, it's a country in the crosshairs of a lot of enemies. But undeterred, the Kurdistan regional government held a second independence referendum in September 2017. The context here was substantially different. The Peshmerga had just played a substantial role in pushing back the Islamic State and it captured lots of territory it claimed as rightfully belonging to Kurdistan, as in it had once belonged to Kurdistan, but previous governments had moved the Kurdish people out and replaced them with Turkish or Arabic-speaking people. That's the claim, anyway. And yes, it's extremely unusual, perhaps unprecedented, for an internal region to, to capture territory from its parent country. But that's what happened. This time, 92.7% of the population voted for independence, not quite as high as before, but still an overwhelming result. The Kurdistan regional government claimed the result was binding and invited the Iraqi government to begin talks to prepare for secession. The Iraqi courts ruled the referendum illegal, however, and within a month, the Iraqi army mounted an offensive and retook nearly all of the territory that the Peshmerga had won in its fight with Islamic State. It was an embarrassing turn of events for the Kurdistan regional government, and it was this, not the law on presidential terms, but a military defeat, which led to the resignation of longtime President Masoud Barzani after 12 years in office. There's also a whole other area of Iraqi politics I haven't even really touched on. As a constituent part of Iraq, the Kurdistan region takes part in national elections and sends its own representatives to sit in Iraq's parliament, known as the Council of Representatives. 
These elections are important events in the Kurdish political calendar and are hotly contested by the various parties in the Kurdistan region, but I've decided not to cover these in detail just to try and keep this video more straightforward. And I think Iraqi national elections are going to be an important part of political life in the Kurdistan region for some time. Or in other words, despite the two overwhelming referendum results, I don't think there's much chance of Iraqi Kurdistan gaining independence anytime soon. This is largely down to geopolitics. No one other than the Kurds themselves seems to want the Kurds to have their own country. But if the Kurdistan region wanted to bolster its case for achieving independence someday, making some democratic reforms would be an enormous step. Yes, democracy exists in the Kurdistan region, but it is deeply flawed, and the total dominance of the Barzani and Talibani families in daily life is holding the country back. Thanks for watching. I'd really like to thank the many Kurdish people who agreed to talk to me anonymously so that I could make this video. It was a huge help because, to be honest, I found it very difficult to understand Kurdish politics from the outside. Saying that, I'm sure this video probably contains a few mistakes, and those are my fault, not the fault of the people I spoke to. Secondly, I'd like to say I really began this video expecting it to be something like the videos I've made for Somaliland. There's so many parallels. These two peoples have endured genocides and then have created their own countries and have both made enormous progress in the past 30 years. And I was actually really surprised to learn about all of the many problems that are being caused in Kurdistan by, by the total dominance of these two families and their parties. So I only came to these conclusions reluctantly. As an American, I've just been used to hearing about Kurdistan and the Peshmerga as just being really cool and amazing and what they do in Iraq is stupendous. And, and I still think that. I, I still sort of naturally gravitate towards Kurds and think, oh, this will be interesting. Oh, these, these are people I'm interested in learning about. So I hope nothing in this video that sounds a bit critical uh, sounds mean or unfair. That was not my intention. I hope you enjoyed this. As I mentioned, I'm hoping to do a video on uh, Rojava soon. So subscribe if you're interested and give this video a like if you'd like more people to see it. And I'll see you guys in the next video.